Falsha, and welcome to our studio series. My name is Ashling, and today I'll be walking you through another one of our quarantine series, a painting done by Tom Thompson. Uh, the painting is called Pine Trees at Sunset, and it was painted in 1915. Now you may have heard of Tom Thompson, he's often associated with the group of seven, but he was actually not an official member. He met an untimely death before the group was actually formed. And his death is shrouded in mysteries, as are his paintings. So join me as we paint this beautiful painting. I'll explain a little bit more about Tom Thompson and how he used technique to create this gorgeous painting. I usually start the painting by sketching in with a very watery paint. I don't use any white usually for this process. The idea is that we're just mapping out where some of the major elements of the painting are. You don't need a fine brush, you can use a large or medium brush. You don't need to dry it off, you can actually use a little bit of the wetness to water down some paint. I am going to use a purple color. If you are just using the primaries, you can mix a little bit of blue and red together and lots of water. So the bottom, like let's say quarter of the painting is the land and everything above is the sky. Now he's got three, paint, three trees in this painting, so let's get those in. Now this will almost entirely get covered up by thicker applications of paint, but I just want to kind of map out where this is all going. So I have three trees, three tall trees, and I have a little scraggly tree here on the side. All right, so I kind of know where this is going. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually do that peachy color in the sky. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's mix ourselves a peach color. I'm going to mix white, yellow, and a little bit of red. I'm going to grab a little bit more white. And a little bit more red get a nice soft peach color. That seems to go right. One trick you can do is you can hold your color sort of in front of your reference just to see if it matches. So I'm going to actually go ahead and paint the entire canvas with this peach color. a bit more red or a bit lighter, a bit more yellow, that's actually okay. We don't mind some variation in the underpainting. Also streaky bits are okay too. Brush strokes still visible. It's not super smooth. 
mostly concerned about the sky because that color is going to peek through behind those trees there. Now that we have our nice warm underpainting in, I'm going to start applying some of the cooler objects to the painting, mainly in blues and purples. We talk a little bit about the importance of the contrast and temperature in painting um, in another video. I'm just going to add a link up here. Um, we also talk a little bit about underpainting in another video, um, so be sure to check those out. Um, so, like I said, we've got our, cool, our warm underpainting in. We're going to start adding some of the cooler elements. I'm using mainly purples and blues. Um, if you're using a reduced palette, you can use a mixture of uh, red and blue to create this color. You're going to use a little bit more blue than red. We want this to be on the bluer side of things. And I've got myself a nice, deep, bluish purple color. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some of this along the horizon. We're going to get this land that is in the distance. Usually land that is in the distance is going to be cooler, icier colors. That's a result of something called atmospheric perspective. All you have to remember uh, for atmospheric, atmospheric perspective is that warmer colors, so the shorter wavelengths, um, will appear in foregrounds and cooler colors, those long kind of marathon running wavelengths will be in the distance. So close is warm, cool is far away. So that's why this land in the distance is a bluish purple. For the tree trunks, I'm going to add a little bit more red just because I want to pull these trees a little closer to the foreground. So I have a little bit more red and it's going to be a bit more of a ruddy, rusty purple color. So you'll see a transformation. So the first tree is on the left side here and I'm going to drag a line up so like so. And my second tree right next door, a couple inches from the base of the first one, this tree fans out a little bit, creating a V shape. I also have a nice, more straight tree here on the right hand side of the painting. So I'm going to plug that in. I'm also going to consider that there is a rock face here in the foreground. So I'm going to add that in. So it's basically like a little wedge of cheese, a little wedge of darkness here. And I'm also going to make my trees a little bit more solid. So the first pass, you're going to get some um, areas where the paint does not cover completely. So I'm going to just go over it again, keeping in mind that my trees will be a bit thicker at the base and a bit thinner at the top. Trees are anchored into the ground. So they're generally a little bit wider at the base. So I'm going to really kind of solidify. I'm actually going to downsize my brush here to get the skinnier tip of this tree. And same thing with this guy on the right. Good. Now we got three trees, or three main trees. I also have some smaller trees in the foreground that I'm going to plug in right now. For these trees, however, I'm going to add a little bit more yellow. This is going to create a greenish tinge to your purple color that you're using. So adding a little bit of yellow into this purplish color. And we should get a nice dark kind of purplish green color. Now I've got a little evergreen over here on the right hand side. So I'm going to drag down a line and I'm going to start doing these little taps to fill in the bulk of this tree. Now these evergreens, the tree branches grow up from the base. So I'm making sure to angle my brush marks up and away from the trunk of the tree. I'm also going to dash in a little bit around the base of the tree because I know that there would be foliage in there. So I'm going to make sure to get that in as well. 
And I'm going to repeat this process on the right hand side where I also have some smaller little evergreens in here as well. So straight kind of lines and I'm, I'm filling in the branches as I go. Keeping in mind that trees are generally more narrow at the top, so I'm going to have less branches here and they're a bit wider at the base, so I can go ahead and tap in some of these very loose tree branches. When I say loose, I mean loosely painted, as in we're not trying to render each and every branch or leaf perfectly. These are just making sort of suggestions of the trees. All right, I'm gonna raise up this mound a little bit. I realized I had plugged it in a little bit low. You can always make adjustments as you go, of course. Nothing is set in stone. A little bit of white from my underpainting got mixed in there, but that's okay. We can cover that up later. We're just getting in our bulk, the bulk of our color and shape here. A little bit more the base. Good. Okay. Now to tackle some of the branches in the main pine trees, which is what this tree, this painting is named for. So keeping lots of blue on my brush here, I want the branches and the leaves of the pines to be a little bit more blue than the actual trunk. The trunk is more solid and the branches and the trees are a little bit less solid. So there's going to be a bit of light affecting their color. So I'm going to start by tapping in just some of the bulk, the main volume of the branches and leaves. I'm not worrying about attaching anything to the actual tree yet. I'm just mapping out where the main bulk of these leaves and branches are going. I'm using a smaller brush, slightly smaller. And they're very spotty right now. And that's what we want. So again, these are very loose loose, so they're not very solid. Just some oddly mottled shapes at the moment. that these are a little bit more blue and then for whatever reason the tree on the right hand side has some much darker bulkier areas so more blue over here and a bit more green again you're more than welcome to play around with these elements um, if you want to make yours a little bit lighter or darker that's totally fine Okay, I'm now going to start to add in some of the smaller details in the trees. For example, right here, I'm going to connect a branch. It's actually going to cross over this tree. So don't worry if your branches crisscross, that's okay. Just some very light suggestions of branches here. I like to make my branches a little bit wiggly so they're not perfectly straight. The idea here is we're trying to create a natural look. And don't worry if there's a gap in your branches. So if you do a line and you lift your brush and you continue that line, sometimes that's actually 
desirable to have a non-continuous line. Okay, so now we have some softer branches in there, some thin, soft branches. And we have the bulk of our tree, um, of the leaves of the trees. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pre-mix some of the colors in the sky. The reason why I'm pre-mixing is because we need quite a bit of this paint, so I don't wanna run out halfway through and I don't want my paint to dry up on me. So let me show you the colors that I've pre-mixed. The sky at the top is this almost acid-like green color. In the middle of the sky, it transforms into this softer yellow color with a little bit of white in it. And at the bottom, it is a very true orange color, but an orange with plenty of yellow in it. What we're gonna do with these colors is a technique called back painting. And back painting was a very popular technique for the group of seven and Tom Thompson. What they used to do is they used to plug in their trees like we've done, and then they would paint the sky color in and around the branches and the trees themselves. The reason why they did that is because this orange color is going to peek through, especially around the edges of the objects in your painting. And this helps create cohesion and gives you this sense of backlighting and provides a little bit of warmth and is a beautiful way to help your painting give you a continuous sort of glow from underneath. If you look closely at any group of seven painting, especially in the sky, you're gonna note this back painting technique. It was very common. Um, and Tom Thompson definitely used back painting here in his uh, version of his original. Let's start to get in some of the sky color. So I'm using the first color, which is this beautiful yellowy orange color at the base. And I'm gonna start to paint around some of the objects, AKA the trees, but I'm gonna make sure to leave a little margin or a little peekaboo of this peachy color shining through. So even in this small tree on the left, I'm gonna tap in some of this orange in and around it, around it, leaving some of that orange, the peachy color shining through. Tom Thompson used quite a bit of paint when he was painting. So don't be afraid to scoop up a good amount of paint here. You might be painting over some of the elements, but that's okay. You can use the underpainting technique to sort of shave off areas that you don't like. So it's also a really great way to help correct any mistakes that you made in your trees. Okay, I'm gonna bring this orange color up a little more. Really starting to get it in and around some of the branches here. Moving up. Just added a little bit more yellow in the middle here just for point of interest around these smaller trees. Now that I have this orange color in the base of the sky, I also want to make sure to add it into some areas in the foreground as well. So there's a little bit of a peekaboo of the lake. That lake is going to be reflecting the sky color. So let's plug this orange into some of the lake as well. We know that that would be reflected into the water. Okay, so we have a little bit of this orange slicing through here as well. Now I am going to pick up a little bit of the new color we're going to add to the main middle section of the sky. For now though, I'm going to leave a little bit of this orange color on my brush and what that will do is it will help blend these two colors together. So it will help create a nice 
transition between the electric orange and the softer yellowy color I'm about to apply. So I have a little bit of my orange still on my brush and I'm going to back it up a little bit. So I'm going to beep, 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 back it up a little bit into my orange and blend it out a little bit so that there's not a harsh line between the orange and the yellow. You can always use your finger to blend a little bit if you need to. And especially around the branches, you're gonna leave a little halo of our underpainting poking through. So the objective here is to not cover all of our underpainting. We need a little bit, little bit of it shining through. Painting around this branch, I'm going to leave some of that orange poking through. Perfection is not the objective. A lot of people compare the group of seven to the Impressionism movement, but um, there's lots that might argue that and say that their, their compositions were more reminiscent of like Art Nouveau. So one of the hallmarks of Impressionism, if you think of Monet, for example, is this atmospheric glazing of light over everything. They loved this sort of um, misty look where colors really blended into each other. The group of seven were not as interested in this sort of atmospheric look. They had bold colors chalked up against other bold colors. And all of the group of seven, including Tom Thompson, were, were, worked in the design industry. So they were all graphic designers. And I can't help but think of Art Nouveau, like Toulouse-Lautrec. There is a certain way that the lines in a group of seven painting work as a composition that really remind me of Art Nouveau. Still definitely interested in the same sort of things that Impressionism was interested in. The Impressionists often took their work outside. They used big brushes and they were working quite fast. The group of seven did the same. They took their paintings up north, painted outside in plein air. Um, but there's something still kind of designy about the group of seven's compositions. So there's not too much blending happening. All right, so we're kind of worked, we've kind of worked our way up through this area here. I'm gonna add a little bit more yellow and white just to make that transition into our green that we're gonna do shortly. So I'm gonna wipe off the orange out of my brush here because I really want to start to cool this sky down. So I'm trying to keep red out. So this is mainly just yellow and white here. Very so just softly applying it around some of these objects. I'm just doing this to help transition into my more acidic green color that we're about to apply. Okay. So again, I'm going to keep my brush with the yellow and the white, and I'm going to dip in to my green color, and I'm going to start to apply that above the yellow and white I just applied, carefully dabbing it in. a area where you have a big bulky area of branches and leaves you can put a hole in it basically by dashing a little bit of the sky color right into that bulk so you can 
break up areas, so if you have a big mass of darkness, you can break it up by dashing in a little bit of your sky color. And now I'm going to pull this color all the way up through the top of the sky. This color goes all the way up. Always leaving little peekaboos of my peach color. It's kind of interesting painting backwards. You kind of got to reverse the way you think about painting. some interest into the foreground. So what I'm going to do to create interest is I'm going to break up some of the larger areas of darkness that we've blocked in. So for example, this rocky ledge, if you look closely at the original, slopes down towards the middle of the painting. I am going to go ahead and include that right now. So I've got a little bit of purple and red mixed together. This is still going to be a very dark color. And I'm going to do some swooping brush strokes pointing down towards the bottom edge of the canvas. There we go. darken the trunks of the trees even a little bit more. If you look carefully at the original, those tree trunks are very, very dark in comparison to the rest of the trees. And I want to make sure that I maintain that contrast. So I'm going to go ahead and mix a little bit of all my dark colors together to get a very dark, almost black color. You could use black if you wanted to. I try to stay away from using pure black and create my own black which will create a little bit more moodiness. So the black that I'm making right now is a mixture of red, dioxazine purple, and blue. Um, and I'm gonna get a really nice dark color. You're more than welcome to use black. If you have black paint at home, that's fine too. But I really, really, really wanna have some nice dark tree trunks. And I'm dragging it up most of the way through the tree. Making sure they're nice and dark. I'm also gonna add the same darkness through some of the smaller trees that I've created. So now I'm painting a little bit on top of my underpainting. So um, it's kind of meta. So the layers of a painting are not always so obvious. When a painter looks at another painter's painting, often what they're trying to figure out is what's underneath and what's on top. And sometimes it's the reverse of what you would expect. Sometimes the sky is the last thing that gets painted on, like in the case of underpainting. I'm going to add a few dashes too, right here along that horizon, just to create the sense of texture along the ground. I'm just adding a little bit more texture, basically. The other thing that I want to do 
is I want to have some areas in the foreground that are a little bit more of like a highlight. So I'm going to mix myself a nice green color, but I don't want it to be an electric green color that we created for the sky, for example. I want this to be a darker green. So I'm going to grab some yellow, some blue, but to keep it nice and dark, I'm going to mix in a little bit of purple or red. You can mix red into your green. Red and green are opposites on the color spectrum, so they'll often cancel each other out. Um, we have a great video on, color, on the color wheel. I'm gonna post that right here. If you're interested in uh, the color wheel, um, it is a very handy exercise to wrap your brain around how colors work. So I'm gonna add a little bit of this more of a mossy kind of green in between some of the areas of the trees here, especially along the top of that ridge line. You can add a little bit more yellow in there. And just gonna dash a little bit of it into the very bottom edge of this foreground to suggest that there might be a little bit of grass growing or some element that is interesting. I'm also gonna tap a little bit around my trees, just at the base of those trees. The other thing that I wanna do is reflections are really, really beautiful in a painting. Um, I wanna brighten up those reflections a little bit. So I'm actually gonna pick up a little bit of a lighter orange color. So I'm basically taking that orange that I had um, used for the reflections and I'm adding a little bit more yellow and white to it and I really want those to pop along this edge here along the water line so I'm gonna just dash in a little bit over top just to create some brighter reflections in here One of the last things to do before you finish your painting is to sign your works. And an interesting story about Tom Thompson is he never got a chance to sign all of his paintings before he died. So some of his colleagues took it upon themselves to not only create a, a seal or like a stamp for his works, some of them actually signed his paintings for him. Um, sometimes you can see Tom Thompson's that are spelled incorrectly. So Thompson was spelled T-H-O-M-S-O-N and some of his signatures have a P included, which was actually misspelled. Um, so this painting, for example, Autumn Foliage, if you look closely in the bottom left-hand corner, he has it spelled T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. Um, so that created quite a bit of confusion. Um, I have a bit of a long name, so I usually just sign my first and last initial. for joining us on this episode of our quarantine series. Once again, I'm Ashling from our studio series. Hit that like button if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. And as always, if you want feedback on your paintings, please DM us on Instagram or email us. There'll be a link below in the description. Um, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.